My name is Melinda Hinkson. I'm an anthropologist at the no, Alfred Deakin the Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. And I'm also director of the Independent Institute of Postcolonial Studies here in Melbourne. And we're very pleased to be co-hosting these meetings over the next week. As we come together, let me acknowledge the Aboriginal countries from which we are all zooming in and speaking from today. Here in Melbourne, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong, Bunurong people, and more widely, the owners, custodians, leaders, and activists who are shouldering the burden of caring for their country at such a difficult time, this time of pandemic lockdowns, as well as catastrophic climate change. I extend a warm greeting to all Indigenous people joining us today. As you know, our gathering this morning extends all the way to Canada. And while welcoming our keynote speaker, Jeff Quantasell, I also acknowledge the country of the Cherokee Nation. I'm going to pass over to Vanessa Borowski now to introduce Jeff and the larger series of discussions. And as I do so, I thank Vanessa for her vision, her determination and hard work over the last several months <laughs> in designing and organizing these meetings. Thanks also to Giles Campbell Wright and Jenny Banks at ADI and Carlos Moreo, Executive Officer of IPCS, who are providing essential technological assistance over coming days. Now, please note that these meetings are being recorded and they'll shortly appear on both the ADI and IPCS websites. Over to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Melinda, um, and welcome to everybody. I've been very pleased by the, the reception and the number of people who've registered for, uh, for these seminars because I think that it's a really important discussion. Um, as most of you will know, the 2017 Uluru Statement um, that was released after the consultation by the Referendum Council on Meaningful recog Recognition for Indigenous Australians um, called for voice, treaty and truth. Although aspects of the Uluru Statement remain contested, I think the desire for some form of truth-telling um, was widely articulated at the dialogues and has been expressed by a number of Indigenous Australians. However, so far there's been um, very little discussion about the nature of the truth-telling that Indigenous and indeed non-Indigenous Australians envisage. So this seminar series really is a very preliminary attempt to begin to grapple with this challenge. And we see it very much as about an opening up of a conversation. And we warmly invite you to participate and share your insights, experiences and ideas. Thus far, the debate about truth telling and transitional justice in settler colonial societies and indeed globally has largely been framed in terms of the notions of reconciliation and recognition. In Australia, recon reconciliation and recognition processes that have taken place have not succeeded in meaningfully recognizing the colonial violence on which the country was founded, nor has it acknowledged indigenous political agency or the need for structural change. I think the government's response to the um, call for a voice in the Uluru Statement is very much indicative of that problem. So the seminar series is an attempt to relocate the discussion about truth telling and um, within a conversation about decolonization in the settler colonial state and a discussion about how or if it can contribute to that aspiration. I would argue that this conversation about decolonization is actually a precondition for meaningful recognition and reconciliation. An equally important objective of the seminar series is to reframe truth telling and the acknowledgement of colonial violence as the equal responsibility of all members of the Australian community, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, working as a collective partnership. So we'll be joined by some wonderful speakers over the next four sessions and um, who've engaged uh, creatively with, sorry, I've got a puppy who's busy chewing my desk, um, who, who um, have engaged with uh, creatively in some of the complexities of um, colonial violence and dispossession in, in Australia. So today we're going to be joined, um, and we're honoured to be joined by our first speaker, Jeff Cordesell, who's speaking all the way from Canada. Um, Jeff Cordesell is a writer, teacher and father from the Cherokee Nation. He's currently Associate Professor 
professor in the Indigenous uh, Studies Department at the University of Victoria and acting director of the Centre for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement. Um, his research and teaching focus on everyday acts of resurgence and the intersections between Indigenous resurgence, climate change, gender and community well-being. He's currently completing work for his forthcoming book on sustainable self-determination, which examines indigenous climate justice, food security, and gender-based resurgence. So no doubt Jeff's presentation will help us think through some of the complexities of truth-telling as he shares his reflections on the truth and reconciliation process in Canada and the role of storytelling as an avenue for decolonization. So Jeff will speak for about 40 minutes and then this will be followed by 20 minutes of a, a discussion. Just a reminder to keep your microphones on mute unless you're speaking. Um, if you would like to ask Jeff a question, you're welcome to post it in the chat or um, unfortunately the virtual hand function apparently is not working. So you'll have to just raise your thumb and we'll do our best to get to you, um, to unmute you so you can ask a question. Over to you, Jeff. What oh, uh, thank you to Vanessa and to Melinda for inviting me to be a part of this important speaker series. So I'll just introduce myself briefly in Cherokee, and then we'll start the uh, the slides and 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 our discussion together. Osio nigada, shalagia yetli egwena sai, Jeff Ganaholido Corntassel Dagwadoa. Uh, so my name is Jeff Corntassel. My Cherokee name is Gano Holido, which means hunter. Um, these days it's been more of a hunter of knowledge since I haven't been uh, really out in the bush uh, doing much hunting these days. But uh, it's good to be with you all. I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the, in the territory of Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples uh, and who whose lands and waters basically shape their political thought, governance, and self-determining authority that should inform how we relate to these places. Um, and I also uh, speak to you on behalf of my family. Um, my family is, uh, my partner is from Secunderabad, India, and I have three teenage uh, uh, kids that are in the house. So if you do hear any ruckus, that's, uh, that's what's happening. Um, and so I'll start the uh, screen sharing here and then we'll, we'll get this going. All right. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's an honor to be speaking to you all. You know, the um, these are some pictures of my family, and whenever I give a talk like this, I always think about the ways in which we relate to each other and the ways in which we're accountable for our words. And uh, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, the ways that truth telling uh, impacts our our relations and how we're accountable. Uh, not only to our relatives, but we're accountable to the land, we're accountable to the water, we're accountable to all of those relationships that form our healthy, um, our healthy well-being um, in our, the ways that we conduct ourselves. So we've had a lot of social distancing guidelines and I put these up just as kind of a humorous way to show that ways in which, in which we've expressed the need for, for guidelines amidst this pandemic. Uh, so, and how Indigenous peoples have gotten innovative in expressing these things. So six feet, meaning three spring salmon apart, right? And then also you see the width of a old growth uh, cedar tree as being uh, acceptable, acceptable social distance. Um, coming to you from the West Coast, of Canada, uh, in Victoria, British Columbia. And, you know, it's also on a more serious note, a lot of indigenous nations have, have closed down their borders to their, their territories, to their waterways, as a way to protect the, the citizens of their, of their nations. And so uh, that has been met by uh, challenges on, on a 
bunch of different levels uh, from fishermen uh, and from other, other hotels and restaurants. And so that struggle for self-determination, that struggle to, uh, to assert your self-determining authority, that is very real out here. And it's, it's, it's important to note that. I wanted to start by sharing a brief version of the how medicine came to the people because it, it informs a lot of my discussion around uh, decolonizing our think our thought process uh, and also around uh, truth telling. And so these are this is some of my tobacco that I grew uh, over the um, during this pandemic over the summer and then also strawberries. But uh, there was a time when Cherokees were taking deer and they weren't uh, honoring the deer that they were killing. And so they had forgotten their age old treaty, their age old agreement to honor the lives of, the, of those animals that had fallen and to honor their families. And so the deer noticed this and they held a council and they held a council and they discussed how disrespectful the Cherokees were being. They, dis they discussed how uh, we were acting in haste and we weren't being uh, very thoughtful in terms of the ways that we were, were killing deer and we we're killing too many deer. And so they said, how can, we, how can we kind of teach them a lesson? And so the bear that was at this council said, well, I found a bow and arrow and um, maybe we can use that against them. And so, you know, the bear was trying, imagine a bear trying to pull back on a boa and uh, couldn't quite do it because of his long claws. So he said, well, if I trim my claws, uh, maybe, I can, maybe I can shoot this, this bow. And immediately the animal said, well, we can't do that because uh, then, you know, that's actually compromising who you are. That's changing who you are. And so the deer spoke up and said, you know what? Uh, we'll give them disease. And so they said, we'll give uh, Cherokees rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases and they'll suffer and they'll see what's going on and they'll understand that they, they caused this. So the Cherokees were hurting uh, a great deal. And uh, the plant nations began to look upon them with uh, sorrow. They saw how, how Cherokees were suffering. And so uh, they looked at the, the people and they said, how can we help them? So the plants held their own council and they said, you know what? We can give them medicines. We can give our own bodies to give them medicines and we can help heal them. We can help bring them back uh, from this terrible state. And so that's how medicine came to the people. And there's a lot of different aspects of this story. And I think one of the most important is consent right? And protocols, following those age-old protocols. And there's even a lesson about how we change ourselves to adapt to colonization when in fact the opposite needs to be, to be true, right? We need to assert who we are uh, rather than change ourselves. So I'm thinking of the part with the bear in it. So there's lots of different lessons. Um, and when you think about how medicine came to the people, it came because we forgot our original vision. We forgot that story that we're supposed to share with succeeding generations around how we treat deer, about how we honor those, those animals and those relations. And so I think this has a lot of lessons for us uh, just about remembering. And it really ties nicely into what Sarah Hunt has called a witnessing methodology, where we need stories, we need those those methods to, to witness and understand how these injustices are occurring. So you can think of the plants as playing this role. They're witnessing what's going on. And then they say, you know, we need to step in. There's something that's happening here that's not right. And so when you think about witnessing as a methodology, uh, it's very important in our communities, right? To come together, to make these observations and then to st step up and engage in behavior that's going to help change the situation, right? To promote the health and well-being of, of indigenous peoples. I think the other part of this story really shows how the land, uh, the land and our bodies are, are intertwined. 
And this is a nice piece by Aaron Consmo from Métis Nation uh, that shows that our bodies are not terra nullius. That is, what happens to the land also happens to our bodies and vice versa, right? And so uh, we've seen in a lot of cases where indigenous land defenders have been criminalized, uh, they've been um, arrested, also that the government of Canada can can engage in state building and can engage in these, these exercises to expand their jurisdiction. And when we know that that responsibility to protect the land, that responsibility to, uh, to honor those relationships, uh, th those come from those deep um, senses of memory, those come from uh, our, our self-determining authority. So I'm gonna give you only a brief overview of, of residential schools because there's just no way to do that justice in the short time, amount of time that we have here today. But uh, this is a picture by Norval Morisot that shows how children were impacted and how families were impacted by residential schools. And of course, residential schools were designed to take children out of their communities and place them in schools that were usually far away from their, not only their families, but from their communities, from their lands, in order to change them, right? In order to uh, basically assimilate them into Canadian culture. And so to strip them of their language, to strip them of literally their hair, uh, to strip them of their, uh, their heritage ultimately. And so this happened on a widespread scale starting in 1884 and it was run by churches and also with the government of Canada. Um, and it didn't end until 1996 when the last two residential schools were closed. And at that point, over 120,000 uh, kids had attended these residential schools over those years, 120,000. And these were also places where kids died, right? They died of things like exposure. They died of things like suicide. Right, these, these residential schools had uh, grave sites, right? What kind of school has a grave site, you ask, right? These are, these are places where kids went to, uh, to die. That's where their spirit was impacted to such a point where, um, where they were ravaged. And so, um, you know, during this time period, there was mobilization by survivors and I do want to say I'm not speaking on behalf of any survivors because uh, I'm, I'm an intergenerational survivor of boarding school in the States, but that's a different system. Uh, that's a different system. So I do want to say that I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone or any experience, but say, uh, suffice it to say these experiences were devastating um, and they were, they had such an impact that they broke up several indigenous families. They broke up those connections to land and place. So we had our uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was formed as, uh, in 2008. It was the first TRC that was formed to focus on indigenous children. And it was formed as a result of a, a class action suit that was filed by survivors in 2006. And part of the, the agreement was that there would be an apology, uh, there would be a, a five-year basically investigation into residential schools. There would be a common experience uh, payout as well as a, an IEP process, which is independent assessment process for more severe cases of trauma, right? And so those, those four things came together and started in 2008 and really getting going in, in 2009 with three justices that you see pictured here. And so they took testimony uh, they, you know, from over uh, 15,000 uh, different people. And I think the thing to note is that this was survivor focused, right? So it was focused on the survivors and their testimony, but it did not um, allow for perpetrators to be named. And that was part of the controversy of this, of this TRC. And so perpetrators weren't named. Uh, except in a few of the instances that I saw where survivors basically said, I want to name this person or these people that uh, committed these heinous acts 
and so they were named in in these momentary acts of i'd say uh decolonizing truth telling right where they actually named them in front of this audience and uh, so that these people could be held to account however uh the focus was on uh, that common experience payout, which you had to demonstrate that you had gone to particular schools during a certain period of time. And it was $10,000 for the first year that you went to the school and 3000 for each year afterwards. Rather arbitrary figure, uh, which also came into uh, controversy uh, because how do you put a price on the years that you've gone to residential school? That you've been taken away from your family mm -hmm. and so there's also the the discussion around uh what do you do with that check when you get it so there are a lot of suicides and there are a lot of uh forms of i'd say violence around these common experience payouts uh that in a sense re-traumatized families that re-traumatized uh some of the survivors that were receiving this money uh so we can go into that um later, but I think uh, the, in 2015, the TRC wrapped up its, its five-year uh, mission, and they issued uh, not only a full report, but also a series of 94 calls to action. And the, these 94 calls to action, uh, this is five years ago that they were issued. Uh, of those calls to action, only about 15% uh, of those have been, or, or 15, have been acted on, right, in any tangible way. So we can get to kind of um, the accountability mechanisms and the, um, in a sense, the need for not only more openness around these calls to action, but also to how do you put them into place? How do you implement them? Well, there are a couple of critiques around reconciliation that I wanted to share with you. One is from the late Art Manual from Shukwetmik uh, Nation. And one of the overriding critiques is that you can't have reconciliation without talking about land, right? You can't actually separate these actions of taking these kids away from their communities, away from their families without addressing the land question. Here in British Columbia, uh, basically, uh, most of the land is unseated. That's why I mentioned that in the acknowledgement. So it's unseated, that is, there has been no treaty to transfer that, uh, that land. In fact, it's, it's indigenous land, right? And so uh, Art and several other uh, people like Leanne Simpson and others have talked about how you can't have true or meaningful reconciliation until we have, I would say, a truthful conversation around stolen land and around how land has been encroached on not just the land but the water has been encroached on and um, we need to address that prior to um, a real meaningful discussion around reconciliation the other aspect of this is because the trc focused so much on children you would think that that would be the first priority for addressing any meaningful change, right? In fact, Cindy Blackstock talks about reconciliation and her definition is, uh, means not having to say you're sorry twice. So what does that actually mean? It means the first time you say you're sorry, it's accompanied with tangible action to address the harm that was done. And so despite Prime Minister Harper's apology, we see, based on Cindy Blackstock's work, uh, Cindy's from Gixan, uh, her research has shown that there are more kids in, um, that have been taken from their homes and put into uh, childcare. Uh, it's at a rate two to three times higher than at the, the height of residential school. That is, this problem still persists. It simply took one agency and transferred those, uh, those genocidal, I would argue, actions to a different agency, in this case, Ministry of Child and Family Development, and some of those adjoining agencies. So we see that rather than say you're sorry once, right, we see multiple apologies around the continued impacts, the negative impacts on Indigenous children. And so this hasn't been addressed in any meaningful way. 
uh, that is stopping this violence and stopping the breakup of, of indigenous families. So this leads me to, uh, to think about, and especially as we're talking about decolonizing truths, and I think of decolonization itself as a process, right? A process that um, is accompanied by, by particular events. So events that raise your consciousness, events that, that really set you on a path towards deepening an understanding of the need to dismantle um, these oppressive organizations, these oppressive institutions. But even more fundamentally, it, the need to, uh, to get your land back, right? So you can't have meaningful reconciliation in my view, and especially meaningful decolonization without addressing land, without addressing the root of, of, of indigenous uh, kind of activism and the root of indigenous relationships. So I see four dead ends in the reconciliation discourse as it's played out in Canada. And I think uh, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, the first is pursuit of reconciliation as political and economic certainty. That is uh, this, this desire to set up framework agreements. In some cases they were called reconciliation agreements. In other cases, they were called new treaties. So there's a BC treaty process. And this idea that we will settle the land question once and for all. However, in the BC treaty process, it actually took much of the land off the table in terms of being able to get your land back. It also, for indigenous nations, uh, it also uh, extinguished original title to the land. So this effort to pursue economic and political certainty is really for the benefit of other foreign direct investors, right? So that they can actually invest in the land. It's not for indigenous nations themselves. The also, the other part of this is reconciliation is returning to a mythical previous condition. This romanticized notion that we were all getting along and then something happened, uh, which often is a, a false narrative. It's also, it's often a myth, right? And so uh, understanding that uh, when we're talking about reconciliation, it actually means a, re, uh, a rethinking of those relationships. It's not just a renewal. It's a rethinking of those relationships that led to such harm. Uh, the third pursuit of reconciliation is a historical reboot. And you see it in the TRC language of needing to turn the page in history, right? This idea of putting history behind us and, and uh, moving forward. There's always that language. It's almost the language of forgive and forget. And, uh, and certainly a lot of the, the public opinion polls have reflected this where people want to forget, they want to put this behind them. And yet we know as indigenous peoples, we have long memories and uh, Cherokees even have a phrase, we have a phrase, uh, learn to live in a longer now, learn your history and your culture and understand that that's part of who you are now. We have to understand that, that um, this, these aspects of, of history are part of who we are now. And so we can't put them aside or we can't ignore them uh, unless we do so at our own peril. And then finally, the pursuit of reconciliation is risk management. This idea that it's simply a stopgap measure, right? Just to hold off on other future land claims, to hold off on future activism. It's a way to mitigate it uh, versus actually resolve the deeper questions around, uh, around land, about uh, the dissolution of families, and the need to promote community. As kind of an alternative to uh, the way the reconciliation discourse has played out with the TRC, uh, we have the witness blanket. And I bring this out as an example. This is Kerry Newman, who's Kwakwakwiak and Stalo. And he's an artist and he's, uh, in 2012, he had this vision of getting materials from former residential schools and weaving them together into a blanket. Uh, some of these materials were, as you see behind them, were pieces of glass, there were doorknobs, there were shoes, all these different items, ice skates, um, all these different items that community sent him. In fact, he said he was overwhelmed at one point because eight, over 800 uh, items were sent to him from 77 different First Nations. Right, and so what do you do with all those things? So he wove those into this beautiful blanket 
which tells the story of these survivors. Um, and since we're talking about how the stories shape us, one of the items that he got was especially troubling. He received a shoe uh, from a residential school and uh, the people that were holding it said they were having bad dreams. And so they gave him the shoe and Carrie realized at that point that he needed to do something different. He needed to take a different approach and treat the shoe as a living being. And so he brought the shoe into his home and he began talking to it. He began explaining what he was trying to do. And he felt a different sense of, I guess, uh, a different sense of ease from, from that entity, right? Um, and so this work profoundly shaped him. And these stories of these survivors are woven into uh, this blanket. And so this is how stories shape us, right? These are, this is a living example of how these stories are shaping who we are, but also shaping how we understand and have come to understand the ravages of residential school and also the resilience of indigenous peoples. Uh, but the witness blankets journey is still continuing, right? It's, it's not just being shown um, at, at uh, different places around the country. Uh, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights wanted to have access to the witness blanket so that they could put it on permanent display. And so my daughter and I went to this ceremony where at Comox First Nation where uh, there was meant to be a handover of the witness blanket to the to the Canadian Human Rights Museum. Now you might say, okay, this seems like a very straightforward thing. Well, what Kerry did is he actually wrote a contract from the perspective of the witness blanket. So the witness blanket itself had agency to decide how it, would, how it needed to be taken care of. And so rather than owning the witness blanket or, uh, or bringing it in as a possession, uh, it is about how to take care of the witness blanket to honor that contract. And so it's a very unique contract, that agreement concerning the stewardship of the witness blanket. And so we, that ceremony was witnessed by us, again, you know, witnessing this truth telling in action, right? Witnessing this compact uh, in a sense between the witness blanket and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, as well as Kerry and his family. I think along those lines, uh, the late uh, Shan Goshorn uh, who's from Eastern Cherokee. She's passed on, unfortunately. Uh, she also wrote truth into her, into her artwork. And I think artists really, really inspire, I think, a lot of us when we think about truth telling and decolonizing uh, these, these forms of communication. So she created, um, uh, she, she titled this particular set of baskets, Resisting the Mission, Filling the Silence but she called uh, her baskets in general protest baskets. And what she did, rather than weave these out of uh, materials that we might usually use like uh, oak, split oak, or honeysuckle or other materials, she took splints of paper, uh, in this case with the names of all the children who attended boarding schools in the US and wove those into a basket. And it's not just any basket, it's a double weave basket, which takes a particular talent, right? To weave a basket inside of a basket simultaneously. Anyway, I think these, uh, and she's done this with a lot of her work, uh, these names and these baskets give testimony uh, to the impacts and the experiences of indigenous peoples. And it's another form of truth telling in asserting these experiences as being uh, important to bring our attention to. Elsewhere in BC, up in, in northern BC, uh, there's been a lot going on with Wet'suwet'en First Nation around uh, free prior and informed consent uh, and their, basically their battles to uh, protect their territories. And so this is a picture of the Unistaten Healing Center and so when I went there. And I bring this example up for a number of reasons, but one of them is this protocol that they practice in order for you to cross the bridge, in order for you to cross into their territory. And I think of this with all of our work that we do, especially on indigenous lands, uh, the indigenous lands of Australia, the indigenous lands of, of Canada, the indigenous lands and waters of, of, of Turtle Island, right? 
And so what would happen is you could see the sign honk and wait. So we honked and waited. And a representative from Wasodin, uh, in this case it was Frida Houston, who ran the healing center, came across the bridge and asked us several questions. Uh, one is, what was your name? And do you work for government or industry? What's your intention? And then the last question that was the most challenging is, is one I urge you to think about, and uh, especially in consideration of, of the indigenous nations that you work with or that you, uh, whose lands you're on. Uh, she said, how will your time here benefit the land and the community? So again, giving the land and community agency and talking about how will your, how will your specific talents, how will your visit here actually benefit us? And those are difficult questions to answer. And so, uh, you know, as an educator, I, I came up with something around education. We were with some what's what in use, so we're able to answer that uh, in terms of them reclaiming their, their heritage and their culture. But uh, that's a difficult question to answer. And so those kinds of questions and also this story, this really new story that I'm sharing with you, help us to better understand uh, the ways that we can engage in, in questions of free prior and informed consent. Well, the story doesn't end there, unfortunately. The uh, Unistaten camp, as well as the Get em Done uh, uh, checkpoint, were in direct line of, the, uh, of several pipelines that were proposed to cut across uh, Wet'suwet'en territory. So in this case, the Coastal Gas Link um, a uh, company wanted to put a uh, natural gas pipeline across the territory. And so despite the refusal of Get em Done, as well as Unistaten, uh, Coastal Gas Link invoked uh, the RCMP and even uh, members of the armed forces for a violent raid in early 2019, in which uh, 14 people were arrested. And again, where is the free prior and informed consent, right? And so these are the new forms of truth tellers in the sense that uh, they are standing up for their land as land defenders, uh, but they're also documenting this violation of the very laws that, that Canada and other countries claim to be adhering to. And so here you see pictures from that day at uh, Get Em Done. And of course, it didn't end there. And the reason I put this uh, picture up is this is Unistaten in February of 2020. And it has reconciliation across the bridge. So that's a very same checkpoint that you saw earlier. And so in order to uh, go onto Unistaten territory, uh, the RCMP had to actually cut through the reconciliation sign, which is very symbolic, right? And it uh, again shows the innovation of, of indigenous nations of showing these new uh, kind of pictorial representations of colonization. And so these red dresses represent murdered and, dis and missing indigenous women and girls. And so these officers, in this case, 30 police cars were called to Unistaten uh, after uh, Unistaten had evicted Coastal Gas Link from their territory and they arrested six uh, indigenous women who were doing ceremony. And so Frida Hewson was, was one of those women. Um, and so as she was doing ceremony, she was arrested. And of course, this is a quote from her, but um, again, getting at the, that link between land and bodies. So one of the, the mistakes or one of the maybe not a mistake as much as the one of the calculated decisions of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was to separate land from the question of the impacts on the children. And of course, you can't do everything in one five-year period. Uh, but we also have to convey that the land is not separate from us. Uh, what happens on the land happens to us. And a little bit closer to where you all are uh, when you think of, of the rights of nature and how uh, the, the personhood that's being granted to, uh, to rivers in places like the Fanganui River in New Zealand or Aotearoa, um, we think of different ways that uh, personhood is being applied in, in Turtle Island uh, to, to different rivers and, and 
and lens. Um, these are our new forms of thinking about uh, how violence is occurring on the land, but these are also new forms of thinking about protections uh, to the land and to the waters that we live on. During this raid on um, the second raid on Unistaten, uh, you know, UNDRIP had been passed, of course, in uh, 2007, and it was passed uh, with a, a vote against it from Canada, vote against it from the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Well, Canada came back in 2016 and said that they will remove their permanent objector status to UNDRIP, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Also took it a step further in British Columbia and became one of the few places in the world where we put UNDRIP into legislation in 2019. So that's the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, DRIPA. These are terrible acronyms, by the way. Uh, that was put in place in 2019. Um, DRIPA or UNDRIP was, was also featured prominently in the, uh, the calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so that, those calls to action were actually uh, accompanied with this need to uh, put UNDRIP into more tangible legislation. So British Columbia actually did that in 2019 and yet it made no difference and made no impact on the events at Wet'suwet'en and the events on, on other indigenous territories uh, as, it, as it was implemented. Causing a lot of people, especially indigenous youth, to say that reconciliation is dead. And so you see the signs of reconciliation is dead uh, at rallies, you see them at, um, at different events and with this this understanding or this, this perception that reconciliation has not led to anything meaningful. It has not led to us uh, not saying you're sorry twice, it has not led to us to anticipate a, a shared future together in any meaningful way. I also think of new forms of, of truth telling, new forms of, um, of solidarity in places like Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii, uh, where they're protecting their sacred mountain, Mauna Kea, uh, from encroachment by a 30 meter telescope that's been proposed. And so as people encamp there to protect the land and to protect that telescope from being built, which would be about an 18 story telescope on the top of this highest peak um, of Mauna Kea, um, also saw signs of the ways that we come together as indigenous nations. So. Uh, you can see the Cherokee Nation flag that's already flying there, uh, but you also see the Maori flag. You see flags from other indigenous nations and even other states. And so it shows that um, we are coming together. We are showing new forms of solidarity in these places. Another aspect of truth telling uh, happened in May of 2013 here on the island. Uh, it was an event where we re reclaimed a place name. And so uh, the, the name that was given was Mount Douglas, it's named after the first governor of BC. And <clears throat> indigenous peoples have always had a different name for that place. And so um, despite putting signs up saying Pakals over the previous decades, those signs were always taken down or discarded. Uh, we went in force with about 500 people led by Wasanich and Lekwungen people and we put a new sign up and the sign basically says Pakals and it gives a little bit of the history. It's another way of implanting those truths back onto the map and we did it without permission from the local, um, local authorities and it's still standing today in 2020 uh, as a sign just to to demonstrate the resilience of indigenous peoples, but also to demonstrate the true and actual name of that place. The other part of this that wasn't spoken about as much in the media is that when you got to the top of this mountain, uh, there was a reenactment of the signing of the Douglas Treaty. And so this reenactment actually was the story and putting that new story uh, back onto the landscape. 
So those 500 people were witnesses to this new story and they now carried that story with them to tell their, uh, their family members, to tell other people what is the real history behind this place. And I think a lot of our visions for, if we want to call it reconciliation, a lot of our visions for relationality are in our treaties. And so uh, there's a new treaty signed, well, it's not so new anymore, but in 2014, the Bison or Buffalo Treaty signed by Blackfeet nations, some 18 Blackfeet nations, uh, both on the US and, and Canadian side of the border. And this treaty was really designed for one basic thing, to honor and respect the buffalo and their relationship to that buffalo. And so every year they have a renewal uh, to renew that commitment to, to protecting that buffalo or that bison. And the, this is a vision, right? This is a vision being put into action. This is truth telling, uh, but it's also, um, it's also a way of strengthening our commitments to our relational uh, responsibilities through collective action. <clears throat> and that's Leroy Little Bear on the right, uh, who's one of the architects of that treaty. And then we have new stories and I'll just close here. Um, we have new stories that, that happen in everyday ways uh, that reflect our, our current truths. So this is my daughter. Uh, this is a few years back, but we we're in the middle of uh, Oklahoma and we decided to stop and help a snapping turtle across the road. The snapping turtle was not that pleased with our intervention. And this is how, this is the correct way, by the way, to, to hold a snapping turtle from the back. So uh, my daughter was insistent, you know, that we help this snapping turtle. And so we helped it across the road. It, it quickly went into the water and it seems like a very simple story, right? Uh, but at a much deeper level, uh, that turtle represents a lot for Cherokees, doxy. Uh, that doxy represents our link to other worlds. So oftentimes Cherokees will say, we come from a world four worlds back. Right? It's that turtle that can go through the land and the water and brings us to these different worlds. Uh, that turtle is also what we use, that turtle shell is what we use in our dances. So uh, Leela uh, currently has kin, uh, tin cans, but normally uh, women would wear um, turtle shells around their ankles to, uh, during our stomp dances. And so this relationship is, is there and it was rekindled with this simple act, the simple everyday act. And these are actions that are often unacknowledged or unseen, but they're significant and that we experience them in profound ways that teach us about our relational responsibilities. So I'll close there and uh, open it up for questions. What do? Thank you very much, Jeff. That was really wonderful and fascinating. Um, just while people are, are maybe thinking of some questions, I think what's really interesting is that you're presenting truth telling as a kind of complex, uh, dispersed, localized form of engagement with the past and the future, as opposed to the, the you know, traditional model of a, a big national com uh, commission where you have, you know, an adjudication basically of people's truths. Here, it seems to be a much more kind of emergent um, and creative approach. So I, I wondered whether you could just comment on that in terms of um, a process for, for Australia. Um, you know, what are the implications if we're thinking about truth telling in the Australian context? Yeah, I think, it, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, you know, Australia is thinking about uh, treaty, right? And developing new treaties with our first treaties with indigenous peoples of that of the place. And I think treaties are an important moment where you sit down and you actually envision what that relationship would look like and has looked like and you set out some guidelines for what those responsibilities are that you'd share. And so I think actually treaty is one of many ways that we can get at uh, these deeper senses of responsibility and these deeper senses of truth. Of course you have to have trust in these settings and you have to have a willingness to engage fully that is, time is always a factor. So I think of, just as an example, 
uh, Cherokee word for peace is tohi. And tohi means peaceful relations, but it also means being on a different time frame. We're working at the pace of nature. So being at the pace of nature means you slow down. Uh, it also means that you are more fluid, you're more dynamic. When we rush things, just like that, how medicine came to the people story, when we rush things, that's where we get illness. That's where we start to become more rigid. And so being on, a, on the Aboriginal time frame of, of events versus the state of Australia time frame would need to happen in order for that to be an effective mechanism would be my would be my sense. So treaty, of course, is just one of many ways, but I think truth telling has to precede uh, these events. That is, you can't, uh, and so we're still in the truth telling stage, I'd say in Canada and in a lot of different settings, um, you know, for before you can get to deeper questions of what does reconciliation look like. Okay. Um... I'm uh, sorry, I'll just read a question from the chat. Um, do you think the settler state will ever behave in a way that means they will no longer have to say sorry once, twice, thrice, and so on? Um, do you have any optimism about that, <laughs> either in the Canadian or the Australian context? I think I must be optimistic because I'm still a teacher. So <laughs> I still think I have, I have some sort of optimism around that. Um, I think the state the settler state is premised on short memories. It's built, it's based on short-term memory and amnesia, collective amnesia. And so I think of, um, you know, there's ignorance and then there's willful ignorance. And oftentimes I see that ignorance itself can be addressed by simply being made aware. You know, did you know this happened? Did you know that these things are happening? versus willful ignorance that I don't have much time for, and I don't think any of us have much time for, because how, how, how do you address people that don't want to hear your truths? How do you address people that don't, or that refuse to listen? And so I think I must be somewhat optimistic, but I, I, don't, um, I don't see it changing anytime soon. I think, you know, the recent events of, whether it's George Floyd, whether it's uh, Chantel Moore in Canada, um, you know, show that, that we still have a long ways to go in terms of addressing some of these deeper systemic forms of racism, but also addressing uh, the sheer willful ignorance of some people that are refusing to acknowledge not only that um, Indigenous peoples are part of this place, uh, but uh, refusing to acknowledge the truths of our, of our experiences, whether it's around residential schools, or whether it's around day-to-day -day acts that, that, that people are encountering that are, that are harmful. So uh, the answer is uh, somewhat, <laughs> I think I'm somewhat optimistic, but I, I don't see it changing anytime soon. Uh, I think we're up for some, some major change, especially as we, you know, we see solidarities now that are emerging that are really encouraging uh, among black and indigenous peoples uh, we see solidarities, you know, that are emerging, that are, you know, developing new treaties and new agreements, new visions, but um, we still have a long ways to go. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, the next question is about the, um, the blanket, the witness blanket. Um, sorry, this is all very, I'm just trying to read the, read the chat and respond. Um, Okay, so uh, somebody's asking you about the strategic role of the symbolic moment of the witness blanket in the reconciliation process. The question is uh, whether the symbolic mo uh, moment is accompanied by fundamental changes in the way the state and society relates to indigenous people, for example. I think that's in some ways coming back to the previous question, you know, uh, the structural difficulties of, of um, actually in, uh, enacting change. Um, so I have to just see what if, yes, is this uh, construction of such a, mo a monument universal in nature? Um, okay, it's quite a long question, but I suppose it's, it's asking also about the kind of symbolic value of, of the witness blanket and the extent to which it actually impacted on um, relations in in the Canadian context. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, what Megan Buller has called the pedagogy of discomfort. And so I, I actually believe when we go into uncomfortable situations, we gain a lot of deeper understanding that we gain some perspective that we didn't otherwise know, especially when we interrogate, why am I uncomfortable in this setting? And so I think I, I, I love Carrie's vision for this because it, it, it uh, allows you to be uncomfortable in this place as we should be with, I, I would call it genocide, um, attempted genocide, uh, as we should be with this violence that occurred at the hands of the state and the, at the hands of the churches. Um, but it also allows you to witness the impacts, right, on contemporary indigenous people. So it's not just putting us in the past. Um, and so I think it has a lot of interpersonal value. I think the people that have gone to see it have been impacted in profound ways. I don't think, if I understand the, uh, the question correctly, I don't think it's had much of an impact on larger policy questions. Uh, I think it's been kind of confined to, I had this amazing experience, boy, you know, indigenous people sure had it difficult, right? And so what I'm hoping is that it translates into something different, into something actionable, but I, I don't have a way of assessing how that's, how the witness blanket per se has impacted uh, change in, in kind of the daily lives of people um, that have witnessed it. So uh, I think the answer is, I think it's a, I think the younger generation has probably been the most impacted. And this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of the youth leadership, right, step up. And even with Wet'suwet'en, there was a huge indigenous youth contingent, as well as people acting in solidarity at the legislature here with this effort to shut down Canada. And it was in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en. So I see that younger people are translating this into action maybe more frequently than, than some of the other folks that are visiting. But, um, but I think it's, it's certainly a great tool to have uh, to, and so we don't forget. It's, I always think of, you know, so much of resurgence work is, is remembering. And so we need, we need tools, we need things that help us remember so that we don't destroy these records so that we don't uh, which is what's going to happen in, I think it's in 2025 or something like that. A lot of the residential school um, testimonials will be destroyed, right? And so, you know, so that we don't forget these testimonies. And so we have living witnesses, but also we have living, uh, in a sense, monuments to the truth telling that has gone on. Thanks. Um, Kevin, would you like to answer, I mean, ask the question yourself? Um, I think Carlos will unmute you. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jeff. That was fascinating. And uh, I'm on uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne as well. Um, my question was that a lot of your stories seem to be about very creative responses, about connecting people, story, performance, as forms of reflective practice. And that seemed in contrast to what you started with the commission being, which seemed to be about talking and listening as a powerful tool, but it, there did seem to be a contrast to me. And I'm wondering whether that, whether you think that idea of connecting people to each other, stories and land is a methodology for truth telling. And then how does that relate to engaging with the state? Mm. That's a great question. I don't know if I'm going to do it justice, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I'll try, though. I think, I think um, what we need is we need about uh, a million different Cheryl Bryce's. So Cheryl Bryce is from Songhees Nation out here, and she started something about uh, 15 years ago called a Colonial Reality Tour. And so to get to your question, I think it is a methodology in the sense that if people don't understand how this impacts place and their situation on that place, then I think they're, they're able to compartmentalize. They're able to, uh, in a sense, uh, shut it out of their everyday lives. And so what we did with Cheryl is we gave her a bullhorn and we packed about 70 people up in a bus 
and we went to different places like Beacon Hill Park and she gave the place name Megan, place where you warm your belly in the sun. She gave the place name and she told, she spoke truth to power about the history of that place and the living history of that place. So Megan is still a place where she gathers camas or Quetlaw, which is a food staple of this area uh, for indigenous peoples. And this is where her family has been gathering this for years. So I think, it, I think in order to be effective and especially since colonization does involve place, right? It involves land, it involves the, you know, this whole notion of settler colonialism as being here to stay, right? It, it's, a, it's a structure and event, right? But it involves land ultimately. In order for us to really be effective with truth telling, I think we have to, uh, to find different ways to get people on the land so that they understand the impacts of their actions on not only subsequent generations, but on those, those places. So she also took us to the gorge, which is a place where a lot of people do kayaking and canoeing. And this is a story of, of literally of Camosun, right? And there's a figure of Camosun in that water. Well, the, the municipality blasted that figure because people couldn't get their kayaks through that narrow part of the, of the river, right? And so she's telling us the destruction of this place and ultimately the destruction of that story at the same time we're witness to that. Right, and we're and she's telling us a story again. So I think you're right. If if I've done any justice to your question, I think we have to have that multi-dimensional aspect uh, in order to really be effective in conveying the 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 impetus here for change, but also for truth telling. Yeah, yeah. Wado, thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, if people are okay to go on for a little bit longer, we've got a couple of questions. I know we've reached time, um, but I think it would be great to continue engaging with Jeff, if you don't mind, Jeff, just for sure. another 10 minutes. Sure, okay. absolutely. Great. Um, Naomi Wolf has a question. Um, Carlos, if you could unmute Naomi. Um, thank you. Um, I'm a Trawai Aboriginal woman. Um, thanks for your contributions, Jeff. It was merely a comment on settler societies that I think the challenge is that there is a lot of cultural amnesia by those societies and, and it's hard for people to acknowledge their own culture without um, uh, being able to engage with other people's cultures. So it's interesting to see that in all of the settler societies across Across the world, there is um, similar responses with violence to truth telling and, um, you know, the, the processes of reconciliation commissions, whether it's in Canada or uh, South Africa, um, it doesn't always end up in the best interests of Indigenous peoples. But thanks, Jeff. I enjoy, um, I enjoy your work and we use it a lot here at ACU. Oh, uh, what do? Thank you, Naomi. And uh, yeah, I think you're totally right. My, I have a colleague, uh, Heidi Stark, who's, uh, she's a Anishinaabe, and she always uses this question. I think it's a good one to ask is, all right, as, as a Cherokee, I know my origin story, and our origin story comes out of the sky arch, and it's this really long story. Uh, what is the origin story of the state? Yeah, tell us your origin story. <laughs> and when you begin to tell that origin story, it doesn't sound so benign. It's very violent, right? It's about discovery, this doctrine of discovery. It's about violence and it's about illegal occupation. So if we begin to ask people, uh, just kind of, you know, everyday citizens of whether it's Australia or Canada or the US or anywhere, you know, what's the origin story as you understand it and forcing them to, in a sense, account for this violence, um, you know, and then understanding that they're not, you know, they're part of that, but they're also, there's, there's new stories to tell about how you can change those relationships. And so for a while, um, I'm going off on tangents now, but for a while I was, I was really getting into different indigenous words for settler. And so uh, in, on the West Coast here, it's Wanitam, which means the hungry people, 
And so, and it's akin to uh, a seagull that lands on your front doorstep and is always asking you for more food. And you know how seagulls are, they're very loud and very noisy. And that's how indigenous people saw settlers in this area. And so my question to, to settlers, you know, to people coming to this area is, how will you change that relationship so that they have to create a new word to describe your behavior, your actions. It might be equally <laughs> repulsive or it might be very positive in the sense of, you know, it's a word for friendship or it's a word for trusted one. But right now, Wanitam is how you're being seen, right? And you're seen as just ravaging the land, always asking for more. So how do we change that relationship so that a new word has to be created? So that's my that's always my spark of hope, but it's also that challenge uh, that we have for, for people in settler society. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. There's just two more questions. Um, Lorraine Towers, if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, Jeff. Um, thank hey you. There. I really enjoyed um, your talk. I'm interested in um, treaties for now and the future. And um, in thinking about that, how we look at treaties of the past, and um, maybe you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the treaties in North America um, were, had education, formal education, as part of the, the deal, if you like. Yeah. And yet that is really what um, also, um, what people got was the residential schools, if, if we collapse that. And so I'm wondering how we move forward into thinking, um, how can treaties be both structured, but also um, uh, have the results that is really envisaged? You know, I mean, how do we go about that? And it's that it just doesn't become a piece of paper, but also an instrument to actually oppress people as it has been in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Uh, so I'd say, first off, you ask experts on treaties and not me. <laughs> no, I, I, I think uh, folks like Gina Starblanket, for example, if you Google her, she's doing some really important work on treaties and especially in current interpretations of treaties. Uh, but my take on that is that the process is just as important as the outcome. So, you know, we've so much are focused on the text of the treaty. And yet when we, when we look at even the Douglas treaties out here, it was, they were thought to be peace and friendship treaties. In fact, at the top of the calls, when, when those chiefs signed that document, it was a blank document. And it was signed with the idea that it was peace and friendship, not a land session, right? And so I think, uh, I think we think about uh, the process in which, we, in, in which we govern those, the treaty making. And it's also, you know, we used to bring our whole town with us to those treaty negotiations, not just four or five people. In fact, there was a famous saying from a Cherokee, he said, he said to the uh, US treaty negotiators, he said, where are the women? And we had brought our whole town. We brought the kids, the women, everyone. They were part of that negotiation. It wasn't just 10 guys standing up there. And so I think we have to think of it differently as a community-wide event, not just some elite event. So it has to be witnessed and understood by a large amount of people. And then I think, I, this is why I always use, I use treaties between indigenous nations because I think that highlights the best possible example. So I use the Buffalo Treaty, but there's also the Haltzek and Haida, Haida Treaty of 2015. There's other treaties, of course, between indigenous nations that are all, all throughout. And those really highlight the processes that we would undertake for ourselves that we would ask settler society to also undertake. So renewal would have to be built in, right? Those renewal processes. And I think of those as ceremony, but it's also a form of witnessing again. It's a form of recommitting to those ideals that you laid out. And it's a, it's a place to address those misunderstandings. If there are misunderstandings, if they're legitimate, uh, you address them. And if there are some harms that have been caused by this treaty, you need to address them there at that point too, with the idea that we can walk away from that treaty uh, if it's not being addressed properly, if it's not a legitimate way or body for addressing our concerns as indigenous people. So just some ideas there. 
I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, ideally it would be in an indigenous language too. So mm -hmm. I would love to see what if, you know, we held Cherokee, a new Cherokee treaty uh, negotiation entirely in Cherokee. And so you have these non-indigenous people struggling to understand what's being said. And it's, trans it's translated by us into English, not by white people into Cherokee, right? Uh, and so I think that would be a beautiful thing too, is it would really reflect our worldviews because our, our languages are so beautiful and so um, comprehensive. So the, just some ideas, uh, but, but I think uh, read up, uh, I think Gina Starblanket and others are doing some really innovative work in this area. Thank you so much, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Just one last question, which I think maybe speaks to the uh, issue of the way forward. Um, John Chatterton, would you like to pose your question? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm speaking from the Wurundjeri land in, uh, here. And um, uh, I was curious about the four points which were a dead end to reconciliation. And I was curious to uh, understand whether there are key points which are could be seen as the living beginning uh, of reconciliation and to, to some extent I think you've already just been touching on on some of those points um, uh, and whether or not they're they're just not the opposite of the dead end but something different thank you yeah great question thanks John um, I think I think those those dead ends I you know I used to say <laughs> similar to the youth, I used to say, reconciliation is dead, you know, just stop with it already. And I, 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 you know, I used even the language test of saying there's no word for reconciliation in Cherokee and, you know, all that stuff. And then I realized we need to get a little bit more nuanced and say, this is why it's problematic, especially it's been, as it's been practiced. And so that's why I had those four dead ends as I see it. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think to some degree, um, you know, it's the stories that help us through. So all of our stories involve, when we tell them in Cherokee, you're all part of the story. So when I'm telling you about the plant nations, you're there at the council with me uh, when I tell you in Cherokee, right? And so um, bringing people into the story in innovative ways to me is an important part of this and what that, what that might look like. Uh, that's what made our stories so beautiful, but also terrifying, right? We have some good Halloween stories that'll scare just about anyone. Um, but those stories are living and they're also always showing us a way through. And so when we go back to those stories, um, you know, those stories, even that how medicine came to the people, it doesn't just end with Cherokees, you know, became sick and they all, you know, we all perished there's a way through that's provided. And so I would say, you know, using those stories as a basis for understanding our governance is an important aspect of this. And then I think, um, you know, uh, I like, I like the colonial reality tours and things like that, but it also has to accompany or be accompanied with some action. And so the other thing that Cheryl did is we created a, or she created a community tool shed. And so as indigenous and non-indigenous peoples coming together, we all converge on those parks and even private land at times, and we pull invasive species. And so if we collectively can start recognizing these invasive species, and I think of invasive species maybe in a broader sense, these invasive ideas, let's attack the mentalities, let's attack racism, let's pull these invasive ideas out of our communities and make a commitment, uh, just like we're pulling these invasive plants out of our communities so that the indigenous uh, plants can thrive, uh, so that we can have a regeneration of indigenous food systems and, uh, and communities. And so, and, and again, I look to the artists. I think there's a lot of really amazing artists that uh, like Carrie, that's why I'm so inspired by people like that, that, that bring people together with a, a common vision He's uh, done a lot of different artwork, but one of his recent ones was something called Earth Drums. And it's just uh, four cedar drums that are in the middle of a park. Uh, 
And the idea is it's reconciliation with the earth, right? And, uh, and these drums actually pick up sounds, right? They pick up, so you're able to interact with it. Um, so what are some ways that we could think about uh, putting our presence back on the land, right? And so that reminds people that we're still here. And so uh, Cherokee artist, uh, Jeff Marley started writing signs in Cherokee and in English saying, we're still here and then putting them in very prominent places in parks, in public places, so that we're not erased. And I think those kinds of things really uh, spark people's maybe memory, but also spark people's ideas around ways that we can, you know, that we still have a presence on this place. So we're not a race so that we have a, a vibrant, um, not only presence, but we're able to, to be honored and respected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, um, for that. Uh, also the wonderful metaphor about rooting out racism. I think it's um, extremely appropriate. Um, I just want to thank you for your generosity of time and um, just to welcome everybody to come to the session tomorrow. We're gonna to have a, a panel discussion tomorrow to continue some of these themes. And then next week, we've also got another two sessions. But thank you very much for, for everyone and uh, to attend and also for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to all of them, um, but I'm sure we could sit here and, and talk for many more hours. So this is really just the start of a process and thank you all for participating in it. What oh, what of Vanessa and to all of you, this is, uh, I love the conversation and let's keep the conversation going, not only this week, but beyond that. So absolutely. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.